in the world, we notice that, you know, if things are kept in order by what they call laws, and um, you can be driving down the street, and, you know, if you're going to break the law, you're going to get a ticket. The laws are representation of order. In fact, in the Old Testament, it spoke about the laws of Moses that were known as in the, in, in the written laws and so forth. And Moses was known as the tutor. And today we have the Holy Spirit who is known as the mentor because he mentors us. So laws were brought in, force, brought in and enforced to keep us in line to protect. Amen. Unfortunately, there are things today that have been not really for protection but are for self-gain. So there are laws. There are laws of physics. There are laws of civil rights laws. There's all kinds of legal laws, which is a representation of legalism. But it is supposed to protect man. Also protect man from harming himself and harming someone else. And there are laws that are spiritual laws. And there are more spiritual laws than we really think. In fact, as we begin to search out spiritual laws, you're going to find out that Jesus is the great spiritual law of all things. And with these spiritual laws, God has given us is for our protection. It's to guide us and mentor us so that we can actually make it home. So they are boundaries and guidelines also, aren't they? One of the things I want to talk about in these spiritual laws is how they not only affect us, but also in representation affecting those around us. Because did you ever notice that when someone breaks the law, someone else has to pay for it? Amen. You know, somebody else is always paying for it because money is taken away from something else that it should have been going to. Or time has been taken away from something else that it should be going to. So there's always a, what we call a reaping, or, or, or what we could say a, a suffering sometimes, so there's either a curse or a blessing in obeying or disobeying the law also. So laws that are given to me and you, there are specific laws. There are physical laws in the natural realm, but then there are spiritual laws. And the word says that my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And one of the things is, is because they don't understand spiritual laws. And the more laws that you understand spiritually, the more you're able to walk in freedom. But if you don't understand the law, you can, you know, you, you can drive in some town and, you know, the, the town is only like a half a mile long, you know. You get to, the, all of a sudden you're doing 60 and it turns to 30 and you don't even realize it. But there's one of the fellow officers there and, uh, and he's like, okay, it's time for a ticket. He's not only the officer, he's the judge and the mayor, you know. But it doesn't matter because if you break the law, there's a price to pay. Amen. And it's the same thing in spiritual laws. If you break the spiritual laws or you don't know the spiritual laws, you're going to pay a price. Amen? Would you turn to Matthew 5? Matthew chapter 5. Spiritual laws. You know, many of us have gone astray because we didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know. We didn't know the laws of God. We didn't know the spiritual laws. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13... Hallelujah. Let's read this together. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then no good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Jesus came to what? Fulfill. Now, you've got to understand something. So, we are the light and the salt of the world, right? He came to fulfill the law which was already given, all right? So if he has fulfilled the law, that means it's been completed. That law has been completed. It's not been abolished. 
Does everybody understand that? It's been completed. It's been fulfilled. But it doesn't mean it's been removed. Hello? We'll get a little bit more understanding here. Go to Hebrews 8. Hebrews 8. Oh, hallelujah. Now it says he came to what? Fulfill it. He didn't come to destroy it. <laughs> hallelujah. That's right. Hebrews 8, 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write on them their, on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So what's he going to do with his law? See, so for him to put it in my heart and in your heart and in our minds, he first had to fulfill it. Does everybody understand that? You can't take something and give it to someone that you don't have. So he had to fulfill the law. Now, and let's go on. In verse 11, None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. Why? Because his spiritual laws have been imparted in man. He knows truth. And verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Has that happened already? Yes. Amen. In that day, says he says, a new covenant. Are we under a new covenant? Amen. Amen. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. But it hasn't been vanished away, is it? Amen. Does everybody get it? Why? Because he completed it. He fulfilled it. Now let me explain this to you. His death fulfilled the law. His resurrection established it. I'm going to explain this. His death fulfilled the law that was already written. His resurrection established the law in me and you. Does everybody got it? Because now you and I are the walking law. In fact, we're more accountable than what was written in the Old Testament. Because those are known as spiritual truths, aren't they? Or spiritual laws. Did I lose anybody? <laughs> okay. His death fulfilled the law, and his resurrection established his law in me and you. All right? Why? By his spirit by his presence in you, by his life in me and you. So he had to first die to fulfill the law and take what he died for and give it to me and you because you can't give something you don't have. Okay, go to Ezekiel 36. This is explain, this, he's explaining how his law is now established in me and you. Now, these are not physical laws. These are spiritual laws. Ezekiel 36. Famous Ezekiel 36. And in verse 23. Want to read it with me? And I will sanctify my great name, which has profaned, been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you because before their eyes. Well, when you understand spiritual laws and all obey spiritual laws, he's exalted. He's exalted. Does everybody understand that? Ezekiel 36? Okay. Now, how's he going to do this? In verse 24. I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of what? Stone. That represents what? The law that Jesus fulfilled. The heart of stone. Wasn't the Ten Commandments written on the stone? This is what Jesus has fulfilled. This was prophesied. Jesus' death fulfilled the law. And what's going to happen? I'm going to take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you what? 
a heart of flesh. Why? Because now the law will become life. It will no longer just be written. It will become life. And the only reason why it became life is because the word became flesh and became life. Does everybody got it? Go to uh, 2 Corinthians 3. And how is this going to be done? By his spirit. By his spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3. And you can hold your finger at Ezekiel 36 if you're still there. Because <laughs> I want to go back to it for one more second. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 2, what does it say? You are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart. Why? Because Jesus fulfilled the law to establish his law. Does everybody understand that? He fulfilled the law by his death, and he established his law in me and you by his resurrection. I'll go back to Ezekiel 36 for a second. What kind of laws? Spiritual laws. Certainly not physical laws. Is everybody back there yet? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's read 26 again. And I will give you a what? New heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What's he doing? He's removed the old covenant, put in the new covenant, removed that which was written in stone and established what is a, a new, whole different set of spiritual laws because he fulfilled the old ones. Now look at Go to verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Isn't that a representation of laws? And you will keep my what? Judgments and what? Do them. Why? Because you are now the written law. Now, the Bible says that the word became flesh. Right? Well, the, the word is the law, isn't it? Now, you were, you were a flesh, right, when you were unsaved. And when you got filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost, you became now the living word. You were a flesh of death, and now you're a living word. Why? Because your stony heart has been taken out, representation that of which was fulfilled by Jesus, and now you have a heart by the Spirit of God, written in your mind and in your heart, the laws of God, spiritual laws of God. That happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when you get baptized with the Holy Spirit, if you've never read the Word, you know it. And it's not about reading in the Word, it's about spiritual laws that tell you what is of God and what is not of God. See, because when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I didn't read the Word. I didn't know the Word, but I knew it was right. Because I understood spiritual laws. In fact, I was afraid of reading the word because I was afraid it was going to interfere with my relationship with the Lord. Because I saw too many people relying on the word instead of him. And it made me afraid. I never wanted to lose my relationship with my father and rely on what was written. Does everybody understand that? That's the difference between religion and relationship. Amen? So Jesus fulfilled the law by his death. Everybody understand that? And he established his law in me and you by his resurrection because he sent the Spirit who is the keeper of the law in me and you. He's called the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Truth. Glory to God. From stone to flesh and from death to life. 2 Corinthians 3. <laughs> Glory to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Go down to verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 7. Glory to God. Would you read it with me? But if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses, because the glory of his countenance, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Why? Because 
the ministry of the Spirit is carrying the spiritual laws within me and you now. You and I are now that which was written in stone, but now alive. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, and the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory that excels. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. So now you and I are representation of the walking, living word. Spiritual laws are imparted in you and me. The thing is, is we have to tap into them if we're listening. That's why fellowship will manifest the spiritual laws of God. You know, we know that if we throw a ball up, it's going to come down. Unless the Lord chooses to hold it up for you, you know. What I mean? <laughs> but, but, you know, there are laws. There's the law of gravity. The earth is rotating. There are physical laws. God created physical laws to maintain the physical realm. But there are spiritual laws that are maintained also. And for me and you to walk in the spiritual realm, there are spiritual laws for me and you to understand. And if we don't understand them, we'll be deceived. Because the one thing the devil doesn't want you to know is the spiritual laws. He wants to keep you right in the natural. Right in the natural. In fact, the word says, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. You know how I many people, believers, do unto something, someone else that they wouldn't want to do unto them? Come on. They're willing to do it to someone else, but they don't want it done to them. You know? That's a spiritual law, isn't it? That's also a physical law, isn't it? Because something's going to happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So we see that there was the law of the natural, known as the tutor, by God, brought into the law of the spiritual which is brought in by the mentor, by the Holy Spirit. Acts 1. Oh, to God be the glory. Acts 1. Hallelujah. And hallelujah. Can everybody hear me back there? In verses 1 through 3. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. You know, Jesus was teaching spiritual laws. <laughs> That's what this is all about, cover to cover, spiritual law. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the what? Holy Spirit had given what? Commandments to the disciples whom he had chosen. What are commandments? Spiritual laws. And who was he giving them to? The disciples. Through who? The Holy Spirit. Does everybody understand that? Why? Because he fulfilled the law. And now he was establishing the law in me and you. But there were a whole set of laws. In fact, there are a numerous number of laws. It's no longer Ten Commandments. It's a gazillion. Because in relationship, God is going to tell you what to do and not what, and what to do and not what to do. Amen? That's where you got to know spiritual laws. Well, you're not going to understand spiritual laws without the Holy Spirit, who is the keeper of the laws. So they've been delivered by the Holy Spirit, haven't they? Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Uh, it said, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible tr tr proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't every kingdom have laws? Amen. What was he teaching them? Spiritual laws of his kingdom. So that they know how to stay in the boundaries of his kingdom and not go in the boundaries of the world. Oh, hallelujah. In Matthew 5, in Matthew 5, in verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever does not teach them, and whoever does, and, and but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is he talking about? Spiritual laws. Whoever teaches them and obeys, you'll be great. Whoever breaks them and teaches them the wrong things will be known as least. For I say to you that unless you're what? Righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now he's expressing this. The scribes and the Pharisees represented the law of the old covenant. Now Jesus died to fulfill the law of the old covenant, didn't he? And his resurrection representation of the law that was fulfilled and now established in me and you with many more laws. Now what he's saying is your righteousness must exceed what was written in the Old Testament or you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. Your righteousness must exceed what the scribes and Pharisees. Is everybody with me? Hallelujah. Um, so spiritual laws are more than what is just written, isn't it? Because the Bible says the letter killed and the spirit brings life. So it's more than what's just written. Because if you truly have a relationship with the Lord, he's going to tell you all kinds of things. Things are going to happen to you every single day in some way you're going to learn a spiritual law. And you're going to utilize those laws for your advantage. Jesus said to his disciples, it's to your advantage that I leave, right? So why? The Holy Spirit can come. Why? Because he's the law keeper. Amen? He's the one that's going to cause me and you to keep the law. He's, going to, he's the one that brings the connection between the spiritual realm and the natural realm. So that you and I can have a relationship with the God of glory who is the Spirit. Hallelujah. Okay. Go to Matthew uh, 11. Matthew chapter 11. In verse 28. Jesus said what? Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. What was he going to teach them? Spiritual law, so you won't get beat up so badly by the natural. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So what was he trying to do? He's trying to put us down the smooth path instead of the rugged road. And when the road is rugged, in the spiritual realm, it will become smooth. Because all things are possible to those who believe. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Simple spiritual law, James 4. One of the greatest spiritual laws. So the only way that you, your righteousness and my righteousness can exceed the scribes and the Pharisees is to be in Christ in the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. That's the only way. Because you know how many people are out there trying to walk upright by the law, and they can't. They can't. Because without relationship with the Spirit, they can't, they can't walk the law. They can't understand spiritual laws. They won't be able to do it. They're still trying to figure it out in their own flesh. What's up? And they won't be able to do it. In James chapter 4, in verse 7. Great spiritual law. Now, you've got to understand something. These are spiritual laws. The whole word of God is spiritual laws. Jesus came to declare the spiritual laws through his spirit so that you and I would understand the spiritual law realm. Read it with me. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, that is a powerful spiritual law. Spiritual laws are spiritual truths, aren't they? So if you're willing to submit to the ways of God, in other words, if you're willing to submit to his spiritual laws, you'll be able to resist the devil and he'll flee. But if you don't submit to his spiritual laws, the devil will have access to you. Has everybody got it? Here's another spiritual law. Look at the next verse. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. That's pretty simple. 
So do you think the devil wants you to draw near to God? So he wants you to call your neighbor, your brother, your sister, and everyone else instead of going to God. And then you're going to get carnal counsel, and you're going to walk in the law of the natural, not law of the spirit. And you're going to get confused, frustrated, and beat up. Because that's for exactly where he wants you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. That's a spiritual law. You know what? Let me tell you something. We could kick a lot of butt of the devil if we would just go by these two laws alone. <laughs> I mean, these two laws alone will get you home. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. And John 12. Hallelujah. John chapter 12. And verse 26. Is everybody there? Verse 20, 20, 25. I'm sorry. Verse 25. Would you read it with me? He who loves his life will lose it. Well, now that's, you know, you try and, you, you try and tell that to a carnal individual. He who loves his life will lose it. They're like, what are you? What? And he who hates his life in this life will keep it for eternal life. And there's another part of Scripture that well, we'll go to in a minute. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. See, it's a spiritual law. Go to uh, Matthew 10. <laughs> and go tell this one to uh, a carnal individual. Matthew 10, 37. Is everybody there? He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. In other words, he's got to be number one. He's got to be number one. You know, I, it's like, you know, you, you're out in the world and you're, you're, you're at work or whatever and people are saying, man, you know, what about this and what about that? And you're like, yeah, I love the Lord. Amen. Wait a minute, man. You know, they don't understand. That's a spiritual law. If he's not number one in your life, it's a spiritual law. He's got to be number one before your spouse, your children, your job, everything. He must be number one. That is a spiritual law. Because it says, if he's not willing to do that, he's not worthy of me. That's a spiritual law. Anyone who's not willing to do that cannot be his disciple. That's a qualification then. So for you and I to be qualified, we must understand the spiritual laws of God and walk in them, or else you'll be disqualified. Hello? I think we're getting somewhere. You're all pretty quiet tonight. And John 6, John chapter 6, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> oh yes John chapter 6 and verse 53 and Jesus said to them most assuredly I say to you unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood you have no life in you now they must have really freaked when he said this spiritual law <laughs> they said what <laughs> Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. Now here's Jesus standing in front of these men alive. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. They must have looked at him like he was out of his mind. In fact, he lost many of his disciples because they didn't get it. He was giving them a spiritual truth, which was a spiritual law that was going to bring them and maintain them to eternal life. He says, uh, my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. That's spiritual food, isn't it? He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, 
and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. <laughs> he who eats this bread will live forever. <laughs> These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand this? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? Hmm. What then, if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. That's a spiritual law. The words that I speak to you are our spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said to them, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. That's powerful. You know what they chose? Physical laws instead of spiritual laws. They went back. They said, man, wait a minute here. We got to eat this guy? <laughs> they didn't get it. They didn't get it. But some of them did. But he was declaring spiritual laws, wasn't he? Because there are spiritual laws that maintain life, a spiritual life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Go to Matthew 7. Why we're here. Jesus died to fulfill the law and his resurrection to establish the law in me and you. In Matthew 7, in verse 1, another spiritual law. Judge not, and you won't be judged. For with the judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye when there's a national grand forest in yours? <laughs> how can you say to your brother let me remove the speck from your own eye and look at the plank in yours or your eye and the plank is mine he says what hypocrite but he gives a spiritual law here Amen. he didn't say not to judge he gives a spiritual law and how to judge Amen. he says first remove the plank from your own eye in other words judge yourself first then judge somebody else or else what you judge them, if you're doing, you're going to be judged from God. Amen? So he says, what? First, what? Remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Does everybody understand that? That's a spiritual law. Spiritual law. Go to uh, Matthew 6, and verse 33. It says, what? But seek first the kingdom of God and his what? righteousness and all these things will be added to you it's another spiritual law he says listen don't call your pastor <laughs> don't call your mom and dad go seek the kingdom of God's righteousness and all things will be added unto you hello now when you can't hear yourself you get a hold of someone in office so you can get godly counsel does everybody understand that and there's nothing wrong with godly counsel because you get confirmation on it. Amen. In fact, the word tells us to get godly counsel. It says, curse is a man who gets ungodly counsel. Amen. But it says, seek the kingdom of God and know that this is seeking the kingdom of God. Even seeking the offices of the kingdom is seeking the kingdom of God. Does everybody understand that? Amen. And then all things will be added onto you. You know how many times the devil tries to push people away from getting counsel of the Lord when they're having a hard time and struggling? But when they finally get it, if they're willing to listen, Holy Ghost is allowed to take his place. Peace, joy, and righteousness is restored in understanding. It's like, and that bonehead devil blinded me again. Amen. You know? But look at we're all vulnerable to it. Every one of us needs counsel. We need counsel every single day from the Spirit of God. That's why he's known as the Spirit of Counsel. Why? He's counseling you on spiritual laws. Does everybody understand this? 
you know, we, we've been so nonchalant on all of this, we read the word and don't even understand it. It's a really, truly spiritual law. That's what it's about. It is a written spiritual law, but it's written in me and you by the Spirit of God for us to understand it. The Bible says that Jesus came to give life abundantly. Well, the only way you and I are going to get life abundantly is to understand the spiritual laws that God has given us and to walk in them. The Word tells us that the devil is a what? A liar, a thief, and he's come to what? Kill and destroy. Right. So do you think he wants you to know the spiritual laws? No. He doesn't want you to know these things. Those are spiritual truths and spiritual laws. Oh, hallelujah. In Matthew 6, verse 1. Praise be to God. Everybody there? Matthew 6 and verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from the Father in heaven. Now, that's someone that's always trying to do something in front of someone to gain man's puff up. You know, but when, it's just like being at work sometimes. Somebody would be out there doing whatever. Yeah, here comes the boss. But at work, and then when the boss leaves, they don't do nothing. They sit on their blessed assurance. Well, you know what? The Lord sees that. Amen. He knows what's what. Amen. <laughs> well, somebody's tools, maybe they're a blessing from God. No, you're a thief. <laughs> that tool that you've been working with can turn into an accursed item to you. Because those are spiritual laws. But the natural man doesn't see it, does he? The natural man is the, the mind of the natural carnal man is wicked still. His heart is still wicked. Wicked is still running his life. Whatever he can get away with, he'll do. Because he does not understand the spiritual laws of God. And he won't until he comes into the kingdom. Oh, to God be the glory. And verse 2. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet. Hi, I did this. That's a spiritual law. Hi, I, yeah, I'm the one that did this. Hi, my name is such and such. My name is Pride. And I, I, and, uh, and I just want everyone to know what I did today for somebody. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as a hypocrite. Um, as a hypocrite, do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory for men. Surely I say to you that that is your reward, glory from men, but not from God. Amen. I can't tell you, man, it blows my mind. You know, because I, I, I interview a lot of people in, in the jail that want to come to the program, and I run across a lot of people who think, claim to be ministers. Claim to be ministers. And, you know, I, I, and it hurts me because they're so blinded. They do not know spiritual laws. And they're deceived. And they think being a minister is putting a suit on and tie and going to church. You know? That's not what it's about. And there's a difference between being ordained by God and being ordained by man. I certainly wouldn't want to be ordained by man. I want to be ordained by God. Amen. And that's, that's the difference. And I run across many of them that, that have been ordained by man. And their glory in themselves. When somebody calls me up and says, Hi, I'm minister such and such. I want to throw up. You know, how about your name? Are you a brother in Christ? Or are you minister such and such? <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyways, it's puffing up of man. Now, of course, there are offices in the body of Christ, aren't they? Amen. Amen. And you have to use wisdom in how to use them. You use them for the ministry of the Lord. That's the fivefold ministry of God in the body of Christ. Why? To 
teach truth till we all come to the knowledge and truth of the Lord and the fullness of Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, of course, you, when you get in office, you're going to find that you're going to use your office. Sometimes you need to use your office to get to somewhere. But you never allow your use the office to bring ex exaltation to man. Amen. Never. Does everybody understand that? Because everyone in this room is being trained to fulfill an office. So you've got to know these things right away. You do not use your office to exalt man. Ooh. You use your office to bring truth and minister to his children. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, where are we now? To God be the glory. Let's go to Matthew Ooh. Six. <laughs> Praise God. And let's go to verse 14. You know, you can even... Um, okay, never mind. Let's go to verse 14. It says what? For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. You know how many people have a hard time in forgiving somebody? That's a spiritual law. In fact, many people bring sicknesses and disease on their own self because they won't forgive. The Bible warns us that when you take communion, that if you hold something against someone else, that you can become sick and die because you haven't truly repented and forgiven someone. Amen? So that's another spiritual law, isn't it? But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So that's a spiritual law. Hallelujah. And Matthew 7, and verse 13, it says what? Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. So he's saying there are many who do not want to go under the spiritual laws. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Wow. So no one said that becoming a Christian was going to be an easy thing. But if you're walking in the Spirit, it's a lot easier than it was. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to uh, verse 21. What does it say? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it is a spiritual law to do the will of God. Anyone who does not do the will of God will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's real simple. It doesn't matter if you prophesy, if you cast out devils, if you lay hands on the sick, whatever. That's not doing the will of God. The will of God is in relationship. What he tells you is doing the will of God, not what you choose to do. There's a difference. And there are many out there who are choosing to do what they want to do for God instead of having God tell them what to do. There's a difference. Does everybody understand that? Now look at the next verse. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not what? Prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. Those are miracle signs and wonders. You would certainly think that that would be the will of God. In that arena it is, but it wasn't for that individual because that individual wasn't right. But God's still rescuing his people through that individual, isn't he? Because he's, his concern is for them. Now look at the next verse. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Wow. Does everybody understand that? Why? They weren't practicing the what? Spiritual laws. Hello? That's what lawlessness is, isn't it? They were not practicing spiritual laws. They were practicing their own laws that they were calling God. But they had a form of godliness but they were denying the spiritual laws. <laughs> and God says, stay away from them. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Go to Jeremiah 17. 
Jeremiah 17, spiritual laws. Hallelujah. In verse 5, is everybody there? Let's read it. Thus says the Lord, Curses a man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. That's someone that walks away from spiritual laws. He begins to trust in his own stuff. I'm going to do it my way, but I'm going to still claim to be a believer. <laughs> For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes. Ooh, he gets blinded, doesn't he? But shall inherit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. That's a dry place. That's spiritual dryness. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Now let me share something with you. Many people say, I trust in God. But they don't. They really don't. Yeah, I trust the Lord, but I'm going to still do it my way. That's not trusting God. Yes, I, I, I trust God and I'm going to accept this counsel, but I'm not going to do it. <laughs> That's not trusting God, is it? That's trusting in self, and that brings a what? Curse. Does everybody understand that? I'm telling you, you can sit in councils and whatever, and you can people go, yeah, 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 yeah. They walk out the door and they go, <laughs> <laughs> and they go right back. They, you know what God just counseled with them? Spiritual laws. And they go right back to their own law. And that's a man who trusts in himself who brings a curse on himself. But a man who trusts in the Lord will be blessed. Now look at, blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord whose hope is in the what? The Lord. In the Lord. Well, if the hope is in the Lord, then you'll get out of the way. For he shall be like a tree planted by waters which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when he comes. Why? Because his trust is in the Lord. Because he's what? He's understood spiritual laws. But its leaf will be green and will not be what? Anxious in the year of drought nor will cease from yielding fruit. Why? He understands spiritual laws, and the spiritual laws are always leading him through the throne room of God. Does everybody understand that? Oh, hallelujah. Psalm 19. Jesus died to fulfill the law, and his resurrection was to establish the law in me and you. Psalm 19, and verse 7. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, these are spiritual laws. What does he say? More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. He's talking about spiritual laws. In keeping them there is great reward. Hallelujah. Now we know what Hosea 4, 6 says. My people are destroyed for what? Lack of knowledge. Lack of spiritual understanding. Lack of spiritual truth. Lack of spiritual laws. Lack of obedience. Lack. They're lacked out. Luke 22, or 24. Luke 24. Oh, hallelujah. Luke 24. Oh, to God be the glory. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Luke 24 and 44. Then, they said to, then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, 
that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. So here's another spiritual law. Repentance leads to salvation. He said, Behold, I send the what? Promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. They were waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, weren't they? Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2. So we know that Jesus' words are life and truth, aren't they? Because they are spiritual laws. What Jesus speaks is a spiritual law. Every part of this Bible is a spiritual law. That's taking us into the spiritual realm, isn't it? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm sorry. Chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Hallelujah. Pull those erasers out. Praise God. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. In verse 11. All Corinthians, we have spoken openly. Everybody there? To you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked with other with unbelievers. That's a spiritual law. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion is light with darkness? And what accord is Christ with Belial? Or what part is believer with an unbeliever? These are spiritual laws, man. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Here's another spiritual law. Come out from among them. <laughs> and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. And I'll receive you. That's a spiritual law. And I'll be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's a spiritual law. Separate yourself. Don't be unable to I had a call from a gentleman today uh, who had left this place. And I usually get calls from people who have left this place trying to tell me how great they're doing. Because they know they didn't complete something of God, and they're trying to, you know, anyway. So... This gentleman called today, and I was like, you know, and he was telling me he's got a good job, and he's got an apartment, he got his phone turned on, and he wants to come to service, this, that, whatever. He's been clean. He's doing great. God is blessing him. And the Holy Spirit was letting me know he's not clean. But it wasn't by drugs. So uh, and he was talking all this stuff, and, you know, I wait for Holy Ghost to pull out the Holy Ghost baseball bat. And so uh, it's like, so I said, so are you fornicating? I was dead silence. <laughs> he said, well, you know, I, I said, well, then you're not clean. He said, well, you know, um, we're going to get married. I said, you either marry her or not marry her. I share with him, I said, you're unclean. And if you die, you go to hell. He said, well, God's blessed me. I said, listen, man, the Bible tells us it rains on the righteous and the wicked. It's your responsibility to know the spiritual truth. Well, uh, 
you know, well, we're going to get married. I said, listen, you either marry her or leave her. Well, we're, we're fine. I said, then you really don't want to marry her. You're just testing to see if you want to marry her, and you're fornicating with her, and you're going to hell. And you're not a believer. Amen. You know, well, I trust God. No, you don't. Because if you trust Him, you'd do the right thing before Him Amen. now. Amen. See, he was boasting how clean he was, but yet he was filthier than someone who was using. Amen. Hello? Amen. Foolish flesh creature. <laughs> Praise be to God. Galatians 5. But I love her. <laughs> Praise God, you're both going to hell. <laughs> she won't look so pretty down there, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Flesh coming off all the time. <laughs> coming back on and burning again. <laughs> Hallelujah. You have a glorified, you're a glorified log <laughs> for Satan. And Galatians 5, 19. Now the works of the flesh are what? Amen. Evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness. This is our spiritual laws. Lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which means drugs, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not inherit the kingdom of God, because Jesus gave us spiritual laws to walk by so that we can get home. Amen. Thank you, Lord. You know, the only re reason why people argue over the circumstance that if you've got Jesus, how can you go to hell, is because they still want to do the lawless deeds. Yes. There should be no argument over it. Because <laughs> if they truly have a relationship in the Spirit, they're willing to do whatever it takes, right? Amen? And they're willing to walk in the spiritual laws. Praise God. Go to Revelation 22. Hallelujah. Amen. Revelation 22 and verse 14. Revelation 22 and verse 14. It says what? Amen. Blessed are those who do His commandments, which means His spiritual laws, right? That they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city, but outside are dogs and sorcerers, sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves to practice a lie. Wow, those are outside. Those are those, so you receive the separation of those who will obey spiritual laws and those who will disobey them. Amen? Hallelujah. So you're going to either be blessed or cursed, right? Go to Malachi 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Is everybody there? In verse 8. Would you read it with me, please? Amen. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. Now listen. He's talking about tithes and offerings. Finances. You know how many people are robbing God? Many, and many believers are robbing God. They think it's all their money. You know why? They're trusting in man and curses the man who trusts in man and blesses the man who trusts in the Lord. You know, it's amazing because some of the guys, when they first get there, they start at the labor pool. They, they, on the one side, it says what their gross amount is. And sometimes, you know, and until they understand it and learn it, I hope that's what it is. They'll put on their whatever they made or a few dollars difference. Let me tell you, you rob God from a dollar, you rob yourself from thousands. One dollar is all it takes. You rob him from one dollar, you just lost thousands of dollars. And it'll take time to try and catch that up. 
well, uh, I gotta pay, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Well, who do you think's telling you all that? Amen. This is a great spiritual law for God to advance us because he says, I come to give life and life more abundantly. People argue over tithing and offerings to God. I mean, I get checks sometimes that say $25.13. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, I thank God for the money, but, if, you know, this person doesn't get it yet, you know? Thirteen cents, I mean, get it down to a penny? How about a ten-cent offering, you know? But anyways. <laughs> you know, I need money. I give it. Because it's a spiritual law. But I wait for the Lord to tell me where to give it and what to do with it. I just don't go do it because that's not the will of God. See, it's the will of God that restore, returns it a hundredfold, not man's will. Amen. That's why the Bible tells you to put it in good soil. Because if you put it in bad soil, it's not God's will. If the Lord has not told you to do this, there are a lot of people giving away money. Oh, I'm going to sow into the kingdom of God. No, did God tell you to do that? Well, uh, I, can't out I can't out give God. I remember there was this powerful woman of God that taught me that right away. She says, listen, you can give all your money away. It doesn't mean you're going to get it all back if you're not doing it according to the will of God. And if God is not telling you to do it somewhere or somehow or whatever, then it's not God's will. Amen. Hallelujah. No, don't come to me and tell me you're not tithing because it's not God's will here. <laughs> You tithe where you're getting fed. <laughs> but you know, it, what happens is then when I need money, I give an offering. And we've been doing it. We've made a standard of constant offerings. We give more than what this ministry takes in. Because that's what sustains us. We do more than our tithe. I have a standard set that the Lord has put on my heart to give every week. And even when the tithe, when what we're given is way above the tithe, he always catches it up or does it more. Does everybody understand that? You don't know how. It's a supernatural spiritual law. It says give and it'll be given back unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, right? Okay. Now look at this. He says, you're robbing me. Don't you rob God. And listen, it's not after taxes, it's before taxes. Amen. Well, this is what I brought home. No, 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 that's not what he's talking about. It's before taxes because it's called first fruit. Amen. He is paying. Everything belongs to him. Listen, he doesn't have to give you the 90%. He could have said, you keep 10 and I'll take 90. Amen. But if you're really in the spirit with the Lord, it's all his anyways. Amen. What do you want to do, Lord? How do you want it? People go out and buy all kinds of things because they need whatever. But they never check with the Lord. They go on a spur of the moment, I need this. I need that. I need... And they never check with God. You know what happens? They spend up a lot more money than what... Because you know what? It usually comes right to them by their path and goes right... Man, I could have bought that. You could have gave me that. And I bought... I mean, you know, something always comes across a person's path if they'll just wait on God, trust Him, and do the spiritual law. Amen? So he says here, because you rob me of tithes and offerings, verse 9, you are cursed with a curse. So you're cursed. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, and there may be food in my house, that there may be food in my house. And try me on this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will be not, not there will not be room enough to receive it. Now listen, he's going to bless your socks off. <laughs> and then it says, and I will rebuke the what? Devourer for your sakes. Who's the devourer? The one that's trying to steal your money. He's gonna, not only going to bless you, then he's going to put a hedge of protection around your money. So that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. 
nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Hello? Okay. <laughs> we got an amen on this? Amen. Praise God. You know all those thoughts that every always comes to you when you get your paycheck. You know I need to do this. I really, I really. Every, the first thought that comes to people sometimes, and I, I remember it used to happen to me, was a cheat God. What a Lord understands. Okay, he understands you're going to be cursed. <laughs> now the thing is, is we need to understand that we're going to be cursed. Amen. That's the understanding he needs to be giving. People get further and further in the hole because they rob God. And then they lose the hedge of protection. They open the door for demonic activity. They usually end up losing their job and everything else. All from a simple spiritual law. You know why? Cursed is the man who trusts in man. It's a spiritual law. Oh, hallelujah. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. Hallelujah. Is everybody all right? Glory to God. First Corinthians chapter 2. Hallelujah. In verse 14, it says what? But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You know, if I was to try and explain to my family how much money is given away to what's needed, they would, they would have me locked up. They would try anyway. You know, they'd, they'd try and convince you. When are you crazy? You give that much money to, to, to man? See, they have no idea that you're giving it to God. You're giving it to God, not to man. What? They, they couldn't understand. You know what they're doing? They're building a bank account on earth and nothing in heaven. But the carnal mind does not understand it, the carnal man, the natural man, for they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. So he is spiritual. In other words, he judges. Why? Because he's judging by spiritual laws, isn't he? Amen. He's able to discern. He's able to judge spiritual laws. Hallelujah. Let's go to uh, John 5. You know, the other spiritual law is that Jesus expressed that if we repent, not only is salvation, the gift of salvation available, but that if we'll seek, the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available. Amen. Amen? Those are promises from God. Those are spiritual laws. And when the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes, we get the spirit of truth that guides us to all truth and teaches us spiritual laws. Because the Word says that you need no teacher. It says the anointing that is in you, you need no teacher. For the Holy Spirit will teach you and guide you and bring to remembrance all the things of the spiritual laws. If we're listening. And John 5. Is that what I said? Yes. Praise God. John chapter 5 and verse 39. Now this is very, very powerful in how Jesus fulfilled the law in his death and has established his law in me and you through the resurrection. And John 39... John 5, 39, I'm sorry. John 39, whoa. John 5, 39, is everybody there? He's telling the Pharisees and Sadducees, he says, listen, you search the scriptures for in them you think they have, you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Now he's talking about which was written of him, right? He's saying you think you have eternal life because they testify of me. He says, but you are not willing to come to me that you may have it. There's a difference. Because 
he was the one that was fulfilling the law and establishing the law in man, in man so that they can have eternal life. Why? Because there'd be spiritual laws that will guide them home safely. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, Mark 16. Another spiritual law. In verse 17. And these signs will follow those who believe or follow me, right? It says, In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. So you got to understand, a spiritual law is anyone who follows the Lord in spirit, signs and wonders will follow him. That's a spiritual law. And they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Why? Because they're walking in spiritual laws. Signs and wonders will follow you. Let's go to... 2 Corinthians 9. Is everybody there? What does it say? Oh, verse 6. <laughs> what does it say? It says a lot of stuff, huh? Hallelujah. It says what? He who sows sparingly, so reaps sparingly. So we see that there's something that's happening. There's about it's the spiritual law of sowing and reaping. If you're going to sow wimply, you're going to reap wimply. <laughs> Called sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. But of course, it's got to be according to the will of God, right? That's a spiritual law. In fact, every all the spiritual laws are laid upon the foundation of sowing and reaping, isn't it? If you do this, God will do that. Everything is laid upon that. You draw near to God, God draws near to you. You submit to God, you can resist the devil. You repent, he grants you salvation. You wait on the Lord and seek him, he'll baptize you in the Holy Ghost. If you do this, he'll do that. Amen? Now go to Galatians 6. And we'll end here. Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. Is everybody there? Let's read it together. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. So God's not mocked. He knows exactly what you're sowing. If you're sowing with the spiritual laws, you're going to reap life. And it says, verse 8, For he who sows to his flesh will reap, of the flesh will reap what? Corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit what? Reap everlasting life. So we see that these are spiritual laws. Everything lies on the foundation of sowing and reaping. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Amen? Amen. So let's follow the spiritual laws. Know that everything is written, is guided for me and you as a spiritual law to walk on the other side to keep us and protect us. Amen? Amen? So we want to obey and submit to the laws of God. And they're already in you. You don't have to just read them. They're already in you. You already know them. Now you just have to listen to what he's telling you what to do. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Grant this counsel, correction, and direction, wisdom, and knowledge, and understanding of your spiritual laws and the anointing to be obedient to what you're asking us to do. And we promise to give you all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.